We're continuing our series on truth matters. Can you all say that? Truth. truth matters. But let me tell you a story. There was a young boy, six years old, who started screaming, running out of the bathroom, looking for his mother. His mother, when, he, when she heard his voice, ran to her son. I said, son, what's wrong? What's wrong? And the son said, mom, mom, you won't believe it. I dropped my toothbrush in the toilet. Has that happened to you? The mom says, calm down, calm down. Don't worry. Everything will be okay. I will get your toothbrush out of the toilet. We'll throw it away, and I'll buy you a new one. The boy said, oh, thanks so much, mom. And then he stopped, and he started thinking. And then he ran into the bathroom and grabbed her toothbrush and said, mom, mom, we need better to throw your, your toothbrush as well because it fell in the toilet a few days ago. <laughs> oh, no. I don't want to be that mom. You know, our toothbrush is very sacred, right? Very sacred. Well, truth is interesting because oftentimes truth is distasteful and truth is hard to hear. Would you agree? Sometimes the truth can hurt. Sometimes the truth can hurt, especially when the mom found out about the truth of her toothbrush. Do you all want to know the truth? Do you really want to know the truth? Some people can't handle the truth. When, let me ask you, when do we want to know the truth? When do we want to know the truth? As soon as possible, right? We want to know the truth as soon as possible. That's the way it is, friends. Well, consider again in the case of the toothbrush. It would be better to know sooner than later in that case. There are people today who are like an ostrich. They put their head in the sand and they don't want to face the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. Do you know people like that? They don't want to get a medical checkup because they don't want to face the truth. They don't want to hear people say the truth because they can't handle the truth. But can you handle the truth? Can you handle the truth? Well, the title of our message today from Truth Matters is Be a Witness, Speak the Truth in Love. What is a witness? A witness is someone who testifies proof that they were firsthand witnesses, that they saw they experience, they have knowledge of what they've seen and heard. Now, our responsibility is to share the truth of the gospel, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, with love. That's our responsibility. We're not to water down. We're not to compromise the gospel truth. Why? Because a lot of lives and their eternity is dependent on the truth. Remember that. Now, whether they accept the truth with joy and gladness, or whether they reject the truth with sadness and, and mocking, that's up to them. That's really up to them. God will work in their hearts. But for us to be a witness, we must be credible. We must be courageous, and we must be Christ-centered. Now, let me just point out that none of these things you and I can do on our own. We need God's grace in order to be credible, courageous, and Christ-centered. And as we humble ourselves, as we draw closer to God, as we walk in humility, friends, this will come about in our lives. These traits will come about in our lives. This sermon today will focus on chapter 24, chapter 25, and chapter 26, believe it or not. We're going to do chapter 27 alone next Sunday, okay? So if you want, read this week, chapter 27. In these three chapters, we see how the Apostle Paul faces a trial before governors, Felix, Festus, and King Agrippa. He defends himself. So we see his defense. At the same time, we see the three responses from these men that Paul shared the gospel to, and we'll see their response. My prayer is that if you have not made a positive response to the gospel, hopefully today will be your turning point. And those of you who are committed believers, my prayer is that you would be encouraged to share the gospel of truth to your family, to your friends, and to others. Now, when we left off last week, remember what we talked about? You all, 470 of you brave Roman soldiers, you, what did you do? You escorted me to Caesarea, remember that? And I really admire how you protected me. You protected me from those 40-plus assassins up in the balcony. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, because I really felt protected. I really felt your protection, because I know that you would die for me if you had to. Right? <laughs> well, you know I'm talking about the Apostle Paul, how he was a prisoner brought from, 
from Jerusalem, escorted like an emperor, 470 men, strong men, all the way to Caesarea. He gets to Jerusalem, he gets to Caesarea, he's under the custody of the governor named Felix. Felix. Now, remember, Paul went from barracks to B&B. He went from prison to the palace under Governor Felix, who is the governor of Judea. Understand this. The apostle Paul was on trial because many religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, were, I would say, intimidated by him. He had so much power. He had so much influence over a lot of people that they were losing their following. And it was over theological issues. So that's what was happening. Let's take the very first point. Credible. Can you all say that? Credible. Credible. In Acts chapter 24, verse 1, this is the story. After five days, so Paul was in Caesarea for five days. After five days, the high priest, Ananias, came down with some elders with an attorney named Tertullus. Can you all say that? Tertullus. And they brought charges to the governor against Paul. What's happening here is the whole council comes before Felix and says, these are the charges, these are our accusations against Paul. Do you know what they accused him of? Do you know what they accused him of? Three things. Let me give you those three things. Number one, he stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world. Can you imagine that statement? He stirs up dissension. In other words, their first accusation was sedition. Activista siya. He was gathering up people to go against the government. In other words, he was a political criminal. That's their accusation. Against all the Jews throughout the world. Can you imagine the world? They really meant the Roman Empire. That was the very first accusation. Accusation number two. He's the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. They're saying he is a sectarian. He is a cultist. Why is that? Because he was a religious heretic. A religious heretic. Sect of the Nazarenes. That's accusation number two. Accusation number three. He goes about to profane the temple. Remember? They were accusing Paul of saying, you went to the temple and you brought a Gentile with you. That cannot be. The Gentile defiled the temple. And so they're telling Paul, Paul, that is sacrilege. Because of what you did, that's blasphemy towards God. You're a blasphemer towards God. Those are the three accusations. Now Paul defends himself. And listen to his defense. He says here, Since you can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. He says, How can I be a seditionist? How can I be a political criminal of Jerusalem? I just arrived 12 days ago. I, I didn't have time to gather all these people and to cause people to, to riot. I didn't, how could I do that? He goes on. He says, Neither in the temple nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. Nor can they prove to you the charges for, of which they now accuse me. How could I be accused of sedition when, when I didn't have time to, to gather people? Completely baseless and false accusation. Verse 14 says, But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers. So in reference to sectarian, being a follower of God, he says, I admit, I admit that I am a, a Jew. I follow Judaism, just like all of you do. I follow it and I serve the God of our fathers. He was saying, I am a very true Jew. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. So Paul's saying, I believe everything in the law and the prophets, meaning I believe that there's a hope to come, a Messiah that was talked about. I believe in God so much more than all of you. In other words, he's saying, you guys are heretics compared to me. You're heretics. Verse 15, having a hope in God. Continue. Which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. He says, look at me. I follow Judaism much more than you because you don't even believe in the resurrection. You don't believe in this, in this hope in God, but I do. Friends, he was saying, I worship the God of the Jews. 
I'm a Jew heart and heart. But they don't believe in all these things that Paul believes in. Look at verse 17 and 18. How after several years I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings in which they found me occupied, busy in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. How could you say that I was sacrilegious? How could you say I was a blasphemer towards God? When I was in the temple, I didn't do any of those things you claim. I was there and I was being purified. I was, I was right, rightly there, worshiping God in the temple. So for the three accusations, Paul clearly stated, look, there is no basis for your false accusations against me. Each and every one of them I can dismiss. And then he throws a charge against these people. He says, I did not violate the law. I'm, I did not violate the crime or anything. But he says to them, verse 19, 18 and 19, but there were some Jews from Asia who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they should, be, if they should have anything against me. In other words, he's saying, where are my accusers? Where are those people who saw me actually commit those crimes? They should be here. They should be present among us because they should bring that testimony against me. But where are they? Where are they? They're not here. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. That's what he was saying. Friends, what about us today? What about us? None of us is perfect. That's a given. But are we today living a life that people can point the finger at us and say, your life is, don't even talk. You know, your life is, it doesn't match your words. You talk and talk about Christianity, but you don't, you're not fit to talk about him. Are you credible? Are you a credible witness of what God has done in your life? That's what Paul's saying. We need friends to walk our talk. But sometimes the truth is we can't even see our faults. We live our lives not seeing the truth. And this is where I really suggest that you ask someone who you truly love, who you can count on, who will be willing to share with you the truth, to speak the truth in love, even if it hurts, because we need to hear the truth. And even if the truth hurts, let me tell you, it heals. So find out what is it about your life that you need to, to put together. Don't keep living your life in a veiled, blind, rose-colored glass situation because it's just leading you in the wrong direction. Be credible. That's what Paul's saying. Governor Felix, he knew exactly about the case of Paul. And he knew that Paul was innocent. He did not commit any crime against Rome or against the state. So he remembers the, the letter that that uh, Claudius Lysias sent him. The letter in Acts chapter 23, verse 29. This is the letter that Governor Felix received when Paul arrived. It says here, I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. Claudius Lysias, the Roman commander, he was saying, Felix, this guy is innocent. He didn't break any Roman law. Yes, he has issues, religious issues about their own law, but not about, the Rome, not about Rome. As far as Rome is concerned, Paul did not do anything. Paul didn't do anything. From the moment Paul stood up and started speaking, the Jewish council and the lawyer just kept quiet. Their mouths were just slammed shut. They couldn't say a thing. Because as Paul spoke, his, his speech was credible, his words were right, and it turns out that there was no crime, no crime, no criminal event, no nothing. But Felix, the governor, now has a problem. He has a problem because he has Paul in his hands. And Paul is supposed to be a Roman. And Romans have legal rights. If he mishandles the rights of Paul, he could get in trouble as a governor. But the governor also knew that he had worse problems, which are the many Jews who were angry at Paul. And if he would judge against the Jews, these Jews could revolt and could possibly topple him from his position. So that's what Felix faced. Remember Pilate, when Pilate was presenting Barabbas and Jesus, and the crowd were sh shouting, crucify Jesus, we want Jesus to die. Well, Pilate just gave Barabbas to the crowd and, and had Jesus crucified. Why? He wanted to appease and pacify the Jews. He knows that if they revolted, he could lose his position. 
And so that's what Felix is thinking as well. I can lose my position. I can lose my position. Verse 22 goes on. But Felix having a more exact knowledge about the way. What does this mean? The way here is the way of Christians. The author Luke knew that Felix knew about Christianity. He heard. He's witnessed. He's, he's seen these things. There are a lot of people who are Christians in, in their area. It goes on to say, put them off saying, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. So in spite of him knowing the way, what did he do? He put off the decision, saying, let me call commander Claudius Lysias to come over, and he will be in our presence, and then I'll decide on the case. Do you know what? Lysias was never called. Never called. And, and Felix probably had no intention of calling him down to Caesarea. And so in, in effect, just like most politicians, this, this governor didn't make a decision. He did not make a decision. He procrastinated. At the same time, he was a coward. He didn't want to decide for either party. It was a convenient indecision. But you know that an indecision is a decision in itself. It's already a decision. Now, the more important thing was the trial of Felix himself. What do I mean? In verse 24, but some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess. Can you all say Drusilla? How many ladies are called Drusilla here? Drusilla? I'm so glad. A few days later, Felix arrives with Drusilla, his wife. This is his third wife, okay? Understand, Drusilla was married at the age of 15, history tells us, to the king of Emesa, who is the ruler of Syria and that area of, of Galilee. She was so beautiful that when Felix saw her, he, he was enamored by her. And he devised a way to steal her from the king. And sure enough, she left the king and she went to him and they had this immoral, deceitful relationship. Disgusting. But they got together and she was about 19 years old at this time. All right? She was a Jewess, which meant that she understood the law of the Jews. We go on to verse 24. It continues. His wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So what happened? Well, when the wife arrived, they called for Paul. And when Paul got there, he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? He spoke the gospel. Paul did not mince words. When he had the opportunity, he told everything about Christianity. He told them about Christ's virgin birth about the miracles of his life, about how he uh, was crucified on the cross, rose from the dead after three days for mankind's sins. He told these people everything. See, friends, our message should never change just because of who we're talking to. We should always speak the truth in love. Always. What's the title of our message? Be a witness, speak the truth in love. No matter who they are, no matter what situation you're in, it says in verse 25, but as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, what happened? Felix became frightened. Felix became frightened. He was terrified. He was afraid. He was filled with fear. Why? Because Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. I, I don't know all the details, but I can just imagine as Paul talked about righteousness, Felix looked at his life and says, boy, I'm not living a life that pleases God. I know that I fall short when it comes to living a righteous life. My life is sinful. It's immoral. It's not, it's not worthy of, of being in the presence of God. He goes on to say, talks about self-control. And Felix probably in his own heart says, I don't have self-control. What I do with, with my life, history tells us he was a corrupt governor. I cannot stand in God's presence. And then when it comes to the judgment to come, He's thinking, wow, when judgment comes, how do I face God? My life is filled with guilt and shame. There's, there's nothing I can do to, to stand before God's presence. So Felix knew that he was not righteous, he had no self-control, and he was guilty of the future judgment. So with this, if you think about it, Felix should have responded with, with humility and said, I need, I need the, this, this faith that you're talking about. Tell me, how do I become a Christian? But instead of asking that, Felix did not. 
Look at his response. He says, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. Paul, go away. Leave my presence. I don't want to hear any more of this. Get away. You know, I believe the Holy Spirit convicted his heart, convicted him of sin, that he was saying, leave me alone. And there are times when I'm sure you share the gospel with people in love, and, and they just say, no, that's for you. I, I don't want to hear about it. Leave me alone. And, and they say, it's not the convenient time. When the right time is right, I'll, I'll call you. The more a person delays, friends, the harder their heart becomes. That's just what happens. A foolish person will say to their heart, tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll work, about, I'll work on that tomorrow. I'll think about it tomorrow. Deceiving themselves that they are in control of their time. Not realizing that when they make an indecision, it's really a decision putting themselves outside of God's saving grace. I remember this story about this doctor who went to his sick patient and told the sick patient, I've got good news for you and bad news. The good news is that you have two days to live. The bad news is I forgot to tell you this yesterday. <laughs> we think we have all the time. You know, the devil tries to lie to us. And his greatest weapon is not to tell us, hey, there's no heaven, there's no hell. No, that's not his greatest lie. His greatest lie is, there's no hurry. Take your time. That's his greatest lie. In Acts chapter 24, verse 26, it says, At the same time, too, he was hoping that what? Money would be given him by Paul. What kind of money is this? It's a bribe. Sohul. He was hoping that Paul, his friends, the churches, because he heard that Paul went to Jerusalem with alms, with money from different churches. Maybe I can get some of that money for myself. So he was hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. Sadly, he was expecting a bribe. He was putting his life on the line for money. It's like he, he loved money, he treasured money, and history tells us he was really a corrupt governor. Remember, Paul tells his disciple Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Everyone? For the love of money is a root to all kinds of evil. And today, I'm sorry to tell you that many people who are blinded by wealth do not see the gospel clearly. They don't see their condition properly. Jesus wrote us, and he says in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, let's all read it together. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, we know what Felix did. He gave up his soul for, for money. In the case of Paul, Paul was credible, but Felix was corrupt. He was crooked, greedy, living an immoral life, choosing to satisfy his personal pleasures with a temporary sinful life of decadence. That's Felix. That's Felix. How sad that there's no mention of Felix in Scripture that his life ever turned around. We never read that. Well, what's the application to you and me? How do we apply this? Let your words and actions be authentic, trustworthy, and believable. Let's read that together. Let your words, be actions, be authentic, trustworthy, and believable. And I put here, no one is perfect because the truth is we, we are never going to be perfect this side of earth. Never this side of heaven. So get closer to God as you build your relationship, intimacy with God. Your, your words will change. Your actions will change. You will establish credibility, not in your own power, but in God's amazing grace as you experience intimacy with Him. Let's look at point number two. Point number two is courageous. Can you all say courageous? Courageous. courageous. Felix, the governor, wanted to please the people, and so he didn't make a decision. He knew that Paul did not deserve to be imprisoned in the palace, but he didn't make a decision. If he released Paul, maybe there would have been a revolt against him. So we look at verse 26 and 27. It says there, Therefore he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. This is Felix calling Paul every so often. But after two years had passed, Felix was what? Succeeded by Portius 
Festus and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul imprisoned. Now listen to this. Felix was so close, so close. For two years, can you imagine? He sent for him for two years that he was with. Here, two years passed. He was with Paul those times. And Paul, I'm sure, shared the gospel with him over and over. But Felix's heart was hardened. He delayed and he kept on delaying for two years and kept this innocent man in custody. And that's, that's, that's far from justice. So history tells us that Felix was booted out. He was relieved from his official position because there was a revolt in Caesarea by the Jews because of another reason. But he was taken out. And then in comes, what's his name? Portius Festus. What a name. This governor comes in and he wants to gain the favor of the people. He's aware that if he does anything wrong, these people can revolt and he might lose his position. And it's always doing favors for the people. So what does he do? Knowing that, that uh, Paul was in prison, he goes to Jerusalem because he wants to gain the favor of the people. Jerusalem is the biggest city in the area of Judea. When he arrives, the Jewish council tells Festus, Festus you know what? Paul is still in your, in your custody. Can you bring him here to Jerusalem? Because we want to try him. We want him to put it under arrest and try him. But they always had a plot to kill Paul, even to ambush him on their way. By God's grace, Governor Festus said, no, Paul is staying in Caesarea. If you want, you can come to Caesarea and we'll have a trial for him there. So sure enough, that's what happened. The Jewish council goes over to Caesarea and they have a, a retrial. In this trial, they bring up the same charges, all the same. Nothing changes. Paul defends himself and Festus knows I, Paul is innocent. He knows Paul is innocent. But he did not want to get his hands dirty. Look at the next verse. Verse 9, Festus wishing, again, to do the Jews a favor, said, everyone, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? So he says, Paul, look, do you want to go to Jerusalem? I'll, I'll hold this trial for you there. Paul, in his wisdom, knew that it would be an unfair trial. He knew at the moment he leaves, he would probably be assassinated. So Paul says, since I'm a Roman citizen, I want to be tried under the Roman rule of Caesar. That's what he says. Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. Continue. I've done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. If then I am wrong, a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, notice, He's saying, if I have committed anything worthy of death, Paul says, I do not refuse to die. You see his courageousness? Continue. But if none of those things is true, which these men accuse me, no one, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. This is Paul's courageousness. He says, if I've done something wrong, I'm willing to die. He was willing to die for the truth. He was also willing to live for the truth. That's how courageous he was. And he says, send me to, to Rome and I'll, be, I'll go under the trial of Roman Caesar. It doesn't matter. Why was Paul so courageous? Because he knew his God. And his God was big. His God was on his side. He knew that he would be in the secure protection of his loving God. A young boy asked his father, Dad, can you tell me how big is God? And as they're walking along, the dad looked up in the sky and he saw far in the distance, he saw a plane. And he says, son, tell me, how big is that plane? And the little boy looked up and says, oh, dad, it's so small, it's so tiny, I can barely even see it. Well, yes, they continued walking. And as they walked, they, got, they went to a, an airport and they saw a plane on the runway. And then the father said, look at that plane. Tell me, son, how big is that plane? And the son was amazed, and he says, Dad, it's huge. It's super, super big. And the dad says, well, just like God, the nearer we are to God, the bigger he is in our lives. The nearer we are to God, the bigger he is in our lives. And Paul was close to God, and that's why he was courageous. That's why he had the courage to say and do what he did. Here's the question to us. How big is your God? 
How big is your God? In the case of Festus, Festus was a coward. Paul was courageous, but Festus was a coward. He was obsessed with being accepted and approved by others. He gave in to the pressure of prioritizing pleasing others rather than God. That's Festus. And today, many people likewise are so de desired to please other people. So they don't make a decision because they know it'll hurt their parents, it'll hurt their, their reputation, their career, whatever it is. So they, they hold back. In the case of Felix, he waited two years while Paul was in prison. Can you imagine? I remember when my family first became Christians, they would share the gospel with me. I would visit them every Thursday because I lived apart from them. And every time I visited them, they would share the gospel. And I would be convicted of my sin because I was living an immoral life. And I tried to avoid them as much as possible. But because I loved them so much, I would still visit them. But every time I visited them, it was another sermon and sermon. I would just want to be, I wanted to avoid them. But after two years passed, I saw that their lives were so changed. They were transformed, all of them. They became credible witnesses for the Lord. And in spite of knowing that as they share these truths with me, they could sever our relationship, no. With courage and boldness, they continued to share with me. And only by God's grace did I surrender my life after two years of listening to all this truth. And it's never been the same. Here's Paul. He knew that he was not going to receive a fair trial from the Jews in Jerusalem or in Caesarea. So he says, send me to Rome. In verse 12, he says, Then Festus had conferred with his counsel and answered, You've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. To Caesar you shall go. Friends, what I think is great here is that Paul did not just ask to be brought to Rome, and he got it. The fact that they would pay for the whole bill was perfect. So he didn't have to spend for anything to go to Rome. What's the application to, for us? Well, the application is when you are ready to die for Jesus, you can live each day for him without fear. Let's say this together. When you are ready to die for Jesus, you can live each day for him without fear. Third point, Christ-centered. Can you all say Christ-centered? Christ-centered. Paul was credible, he was courageous, and now he was Christ-centered. Festus was faced with a big dilemma. What do I do with Paul? I have to send him to Caesar. And if I send him to Caesar, I need to send him with a letter that describes all of his charges. Because how embarrassing if I send him to Rome and he doesn't have a letter of charges. So what does he do? It so happens that in verse 13, now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. There was a king, his name is Agrippa. Now you have to understand the line of Agrippa. His great-grandfather is Herod the Great. Do you remember Herod the Great? He was the one who had all the baby boys, two years and below, killed in Bethlehem for fear of Jesus. Remember? Herod the Great is the one who, who constructed Masada and all these huge temples all over Jerusalem. He was a real builder. His son was King Herod Agrippa I. And we know him basically because he killed James in Acts chapter 12. And then now you have the great-grandson of Herod the Great, King Agrippa II. King Agrippa, his domain was the area of Judea. That was his, his rulership, okay? That's where he ruled. It says that he arrives with who? Bernice. He arrives with Bernice. Who is Bernice? History tells us that Bernice is his sister, the sister of King Agrippa. Now, it also tells us that they lived together and had an immoral relationship. I don't think I have to describe that any further. You know what I mean. Festus, now he organizes an event where King Agrippa, Bernice, and all these people would be, an event where he can hear charges laid against Paul and hear Paul so that he can come up with his own charges that he can write down and send to, to Rome together with Paul. This is what happens. Verse 23, but so, let's all read it together. But so on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. 
You see the picture here? Right away, Ephesus organized this event, and all these people came with great pomp. You know what pomp means? Great flair. It was like a big celebration, big celebrity gathering. Who were there? Commanders, prominent men of the city. All these people gathered to hear Paul. Now, I want you to picture this. This is the, the place where it happened. It's the amphitheater in Caesarea. And if you go with us to the Holy Land trip, you'll, you'll be able to go to this place. This is the actual place facing the sea in Caesarea. Paul is now standing amidst all of these people by himself. Now he's defending himself before them. But this is part of a fulfillment of what God said to Paul. This is your mission, Paul. Remember in Acts chapter 9, verse 15? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name, continue, before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Here it is. Paul is now standing before King Agrippa. This is God's plan for his life. And he starts addressing King Agrippa by telling King Agrippa his personal story. He talks about how he was a Pharisee. He was uh, arresting, convicting, punishing, even killing Christians. And how he went to Damascus in order to catch more Christians. And on the way there, there was a bright light shining down that threw him off his horse. And he heard from, the, from, the, from Jesus in the sky, he heard, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul gave his life to the Lord Jesus, and his life changed. And his purpose changed as well. And hearing all these stories. Now, Paul didn't stop here. He used his occasion with all these people in order to share the gospel. What a wonderful privilege to have this audience to share the gospel. And he now talks about the gospel with love. He tells King Agrippa, he tells Festus, Bernice, and all those prominent men in the city. He says in verse 6, he says, I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. What is this hope and promise? This is the hope and promise to Israel. This is the hope and promise that was given to the world. It's the promise of mankind's Savior and Lord. Later on, Paul wrote to Titus. He says to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Let's read this together. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope, friends, is our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what people are hoping for. And Paul's gospel is so Christ-centered. It's everything about Jesus Christ. He points to Jesus as fulfilling the Scripture. He tells these people, Christ came, He was crucified, He died, He was buried, and He rose from the dead. And Paul always includes the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection is the turning point which proves that Christianity is real. What's the title of our message? Be a witness, speak the truth in love. And Paul, th despite who he was talking to, it didn't matter. He spoke the truth in love. He told them in love. In verse 17 and 18, it goes on to say, I'm sending you, this is what was told him in Damascus, I'm sending you to open the eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. Continue. And from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Notice the gospel message of, of Paul. Look what he says. He talks about opening their eyes. Turn from darkness to light. Talks about the forgiveness of sins, inheritance, inheriting eternal life, heaven, presence of God, faith in me, in Jesus Christ. This is such a gospel -cent Christ-centered message. He goes on in verse 19. He says, So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. He says, I fulfilled it. What did I do? But kept declaring both to the, those in Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea. That's what Paul did. Paul took missionary journeys and went to all these different places, back and forth, building churches, uh, taking care of disciples, building disciples, taking care of church leaders, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. This repentance here is a change of mind. It's a turning away from sin. 
It's a change of your thoughts of God, who God is before in your life to who he is now. And so that's what the repentance is here. He goes on to say, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Saying, and when a person is saved, since they are saved, they ought to do deeds, good works, to prove that they are saved. And that's what it means to do deeds appropriate to repentance. It's not to be saved. Your deeds manifest your salvation. It manifests how you've been transformed. If today you don't do deeds that glorify Christ, then are you really saved? Have you really been transformed? Even these deeds that that are talked about here are deeds that we cannot do on our own. We cannot take any credit for these deeds. The Bible says that God prepared these things beforehand, that we must walk in them. So all the deeds that we do today are God-ordained. He just allows us to walk in them. Now, verse 23 tells us that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason, continue, of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And this is where the Jews had big issue with Paul. Because for them, why were the Gentiles part of salvation? They have no right. They're, they're excluded. They're not even people. That's how they consider them. They're, they're just dogs. They're slaves. They're, they're, no, they're not an entity. And because of that, they, they were against Paul vehemently. That's why they wanted to kill him. But Paul, speaking the truth in love, talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how he, is, how he has come and how he's died and came back to life. Now, as he's saying all of this, Festus, the governor, makes up his own decision in his mind. He knows how to, how to judge Paul. He tells Paul, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, everyone, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. In other words, he's saying, Paul, you're crazy. How could you think these things? Ah, that bright light in Damascus, maybe that's what made you crazy. That vision, those voices you heard, come on, your change of personality, your character, your your purpose, I don't believe that. The resurrection, how could you believe that a person comes back from the dead? He was just saying, you're mad. You have gone mad. Paul replies with courtesy. He says, Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus compliments him, but I utter words of sober truth. And the truth is, friends, many times when we share the gospel, people will think we're crazy. When they say you gave up your past life for a life with Jesus, they'll say, you have gone mad. All that reading, all those Bible studies, you've gone nuts. But Paul says here, I'm sane. I know what I'm saying. Sadly, Festus, he couldn't understand all of this. He was only after his reputation. He wanted to gain the approval of all the Jews that were there. So at this point, what does Paul do? He turns this hearing, this trial around, and he focuses on King Agrippa. He focuses on King Agrippa. He says in verse 26 and 27, For the king knows, he looks at the king and says, For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice. For this has not happened, has been done in a corner. This is out in the open. People know about the resurrection of Christ and his coming back. It says, continue. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. King Agrippa was now against the wall. He was now faced with a question, a truth question. And he had to answer. If he answers... Yes, which he really must believe. He believes in the prophets. He believes in the, in the Old Testament. If he answers yes, then he's also acknowledging that Jesus is the risen Messiah. And he doesn't want to do that. So what does he do? Well, he evades the question. He turns it around with a, with a statement. He says here in verse 28, Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. Can you hear that? Can you hear his heart? In a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. This is one of the saddest, most tragic statements in the Bible. Because here's King Agrippa, so close, so close to giving his life to Christ that he he failed. He chose to evade the question. He rejected the gospel. He says, Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. But I want to tell all of you here today, 
that you and I cannot persuade anyone to become a Christian. We share the gospel with them, but every single person needs to make their own choice based on what they believe in, whether they reject the gospel or accept the gospel. We as Christians, our role is simply to share the gospel with truth, with love, and leave it up to them whether they accept it or reject it. And if they reject it, that's up to them. Agrippa's response, friends, is especially sad because he was almost there. He almost had eternal life. He almost had peace. He almost had true joy, but he missed it by so little. In the case of Paul, Paul was Christ-centered, but Agrippa was a compromiser. He compromised. Why do we say that? He was gripped with his immoral relationship with his sister Bernice that he could not give up, and he refused to let go of his powerful position, prestige, and possessions as king. It's been said that many people miss heaven by 12 inches. Have you heard that? The 12 inches from the head to the heart. That's it, 12 inches. They hear so much, they know so much, they learn so much, but it does not filter down to the heart where it leads to a, an act of the will. I will surrender my life. If it stays all up here like it did with these men, it won't get anywhere. So sadly, that's the case of Governor Felix, Festus, and King Agrippa. They missed heaven. In verse 29, it says to us, And Paul said, I would, I would to God that not only you, continue, but also all who hear me today, all of them, might become what? Both almost and altogether such as I am, except for the chains. So imagine this. Paul is standing before all these people with chains. And as he says this, he says, You know what? My prayer is that all of you will one day become followers of Christ. That's my prayer. And that you wouldn't be like me in these chains. But you know what the irony is? The irony is that all of them, with all their fancy clothes and fanfare that they're going through, they were the ones in bondage. Bondage to sin. They were the ones who were going to suffer for eternity. Whereas Paul, in chains, he was the most free person there was. Free from sin. Free from guilt. That's the case of Paul. A man who was being interviewed for a job was asked by the interviewer, asked him, so tell me, sir, what is your purpose in life? And the man said, my purpose is to go to heaven and bring as many people as I can. And I believe that was Paul's purpose as well. And I pray that that's our purpose and desire as well, to go to heaven and bring as many people as we can. In verse 30 and 31, what happened? The king stood up and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. Continue. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Silently, they made a judgment. They came up with a verdict. Paul is innocent. He's innocent. He was not only credible, courageous, but he was Christ-like, Christ-centered. The application for you and I is this. You will experience God's grace when you put others, when you point others to Christ's love. Let's say that together. You will experience God's grace when you point others to Christ's love. Now, one by one, they stood up and they started walking out. King Agrippa, Bernice, and all these people, they started walking out. They missed the greatest opportunity of their life. And this is the reality, friends. As you share the gospel with other people in love, in truth, they may just walk out. They may criticize. They might ridicule. They might mock. They might, who knows what, but they, they'll reject the gospel. And that, that happens. But when it does, remember, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. And God will work in their hearts. Our role is not to give up on them, just to keep on loving them and keep on sharing the gospel with them. That's our role we must be credible, we must be courageous, and we must be Christ-centered. In verse 32, he goes on, and Agrippa said to Festus, he says, this man might have been set free if he had not, what, appealed to Caesar. In other words, wow, we could have already told this guy, you're, go, you're free, go, go on your way. 
But no, he appealed to Caesar, so he must go to Caesar. Now people are asking, is this a good decision on the case of Paul, that he goes to Rome, or is it a bad decision? What do you think? Good or bad? It's a good decision. Because Paul is fulfilling the mission that God gave him to go to Rome. And now as he goes to Rome, he has a full escort, all expense paid trip to Rome. Believe it or not, that's what he he experiences. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. What does it say? Everyone? But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. The Bible tells us we need to speak the truth in love. As we grow, as we mature in all aspects of our lives, keep speaking the truth. Being a witness, friends, is speaking the truth of the gospel. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it will hurt others. But let me tell you that if you share the truth of the gospel with love, people will see your personal motive. They'll see your heart. And it will not hurt as much because they know your motives are to help them and not to hurt them. My question to you today is, have you been speaking the truth of the gospel with love to others in the past nine months that we've been doing the book of Acts? Have you? If you have not, I will not ask you, where is your compassion for the lost? I will not ask you, where is your trust in the Great Commission? I will not ask you, where is your obedience to God? No, those are the questions I will not ask you. The one question that I will ask you is this. Where is your love for God? Where is your love for God? Why is that the question? Understand this, friends. Sharing the gospel is not something you do out of obligation, but something that results from the overflow of loving God. Evangelism is not an obligation. It's an overflow It must be natural. It just comes forth from you. Friends, the truth is, if you truly love God, you will want to share His love with others. If you truly love Him. You see, love transforms knowledge into action. It transforms knowledge into action. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, it says there, For Christ's love, what? Compels us. Christ's love compels us. It's irresistible. Because you have this love in you, you just want to share it. You want to live it. You want to obey. You want to trust. You want it. It's all about the love of Christ that's in you. As you spend time being intimate with God, this overflows. Let me give you an example. It's like when you first meet this person who's the love of your life. Remember that person? I'm sure you do. What did you do with that person? You spent time with that person. You brought that person out to different places. You spent for meals with that person. You gave that person gifts. You talked endlessly on the phone. Remember those days? Yes. Did you do it out of obligation? No. You did it out of an overflow of your love for that person. It was a natural overflow, a natural byproduct of of wanting to be with that person. And it's the same thing with our love with the Lord. If it just is so intimate, it will overflow. It will overflow. How much do you love Jesus? In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 4, Jesus himself, he says this, but I have this against you. He has this against us, that you have what? Left your first love. Jesus says you've left, you've lost your first love. It's not what it was before. And maybe that speaks to your heart today. You've left your first love. But he doesn't leave us hanging. He tells us what to do in verse 5. He says, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Jesus tells us, remember. Can you all say that? Remember. Remember those, those beautiful times that you had with him. Reminisce over the first times you were with Jesus. Reminisce and remember the times that you, you felt his peace and you received security, peace of mind, the joy Remember the assurance that, that you ha- was revealed to you that you had eternity. Remember those days. And then he goes on to say, repent. Everyone, repent. Repent of your past sins. Repent of the fact that you've been sliding away from him. You've been setting him aside. Ask for forgiveness. Confess your sin and, and thank him for second chances and infinite chances. 
and do everything you can to turn away from that sinful lifestyle. And then he says, do the deeds you did at first. Remember in the beginning, what did you do with him? You listened to him, reading his word. You communicated with him by talking to him in prayer. You spent time with him. You obeyed him. You trusted him. You walked steps with him every, every day. Do the deeds that you did at first to rekindle this. Go back to loving God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. Friends, today, are you certain that you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Are you certain? Or are you like Governor Felix, Governor Festus, and King Agrippa, living a lives deceiving yourself? Oftentimes, we live with excuses. We call ourselves Christians, but the truth is we haven't surrendered fully. Where are you today? Where are you today? Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts, friends. Surrender your life while you still can, while you have that wonderful opportunity to give your life to Christ. Don't delay. The time is now. Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your infinite love for each and every one of us, that because of your grace, we are where we are today. We have this privilege to be a witness of your gospel, to speak the truth in love. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here that we would do just that. We would humble ourselves before you every day and be credible, courageous, and Christ-centered. And through this, Lord, you would use us to change and transform people's lives for your honor and glory. Father, we want to pray for those who are here today as guests, friends of those who love them so much. If you're here as a guest or visitor and God has spoken to your heart, He truly wants you to be part of His family. Would you pray this prayer to God to surrender your life to Him? Let this be the turning point of your life. Say, Lord God, I need you. I admit that I've sinned and I've displeased you. I'm guilty and I confess my sins and I ask you to forgive me. I thank you for Jesus Christ who loved me and gave his life for me. Today I open my heart and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for accepting me as is where is. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me of all my sins and giving me eternal life. I love you, Lord. And I pray for all of us, Father, as we are witnesses in the world, may we shine the light of Jesus that people will come to know him as their Lord and Savior. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. To God be the glory. I love you guys.